Thanks so much for coming out, too. Lovely day outside here you are. Uh, I first heard about Nathan Brown before I even moved to Austin three years ago. I was in Dallas at a critique group, and his name was just like whispering, and then people would be talking. Oh, you got to see this guy. you got to read his books. got to check him out. And uh, at the Georgetown Poetry Festival two years ago, came and taught a workshop, and uh, I still remember that workshop. I've been in a lot of workshops since then, and uh, I just found him very down to earth, very um, present, and uh, enjoyable, and easy to understand, which you don't get all the time. So, uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while now, and uh, I'll get started with the official bio. Uh, Nathan Brown is a songwriter, photographer, and award-winning poet from Northern Oklahoma. Uh, he just moved to Wimberley, I wanted to say that, but uh, he was the Poet Laureate of Oklahoma in 2013-2014. He holds a PhD in English and Journalism, and now he mostly travels and um, teaches workshops, speaks in schools, community groups, performs readings and concerts. Um, he has a CD, which is for sale back then. Uh, he's the author of 11 books, most recently, To Sing Hallucinated, First Thoughts on Last Words. It's got a great cover. Check it out if you haven't seen it yet. And uh, he's been nominated for the Pushcart twice. He won the Oklahoma Book Award in 2009 for one of the books back there. Um, and was a finalist for the 2013 Patterson Poetry Prize. The list goes on and on. I didn't want to take up all your time. I wanted to let Nathan read himself. We'll do a little Q&A after as well. And um, I just wanted to end by saying that we are honored to have him here, uh, former poet of Oklahoma, and um, I hope you enjoy him as much as I have. Nathan Bright. Here I'm gonna I'm just gonna read uh, through a few poems here from that newest book, the one uh, to sing hallucinated, first thoughts on last words, and the, to sing hallucinated comes it comes from Federico Garcia Lorca quote uh, that is basically the way I feel about all my better friends. He said they are a strange but simple folk who sing hallucinated by a brilliant point of light trembling on the horizon. And uh, so, yeah, so each poem in the book is based on someone's last words, okay? And it begins with Socrates and works its way all the way up through John Denver. <laughs> so, covered quite a bit of territory. There. And, uh, the first one I'm going to read you, though, uh, is, uh, is uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And it's very, uh, you know, debatable as to whether or not these were actually his last words, but. The ones that came out are, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the poem is, Unlike Father, Unlike Son. There were those days he didn't want the job. You remember that hard cup in the garden, that stuff he didn't want to drink, but his dad made him take of it anyway. It must be tough to live with a father like that. You've come to save the world, and everywhere you go, restaurants, theaters, bars, everyone just wants to talk to him. Maybe that's why his mother cried at the foot of the cross. She knew how long it would take for people to realize that her son was the better man. Galileo's last words in 1642, and this was one of my favorites when I was doing the research, Galileo's last words to, I, I, Galileo's last middle finger, I guess you might say, to the Catholic Church was this. Nevertheless, it moves. <laughs> <laughs> you took away our center and displaced us. 
moved us away from the command post of God's universe. Then you stuck some bright star, a burning ball with no soul, there in our place instead. How did you think the cardinals and bishops would react to that news? After they'd gone to all that trouble having their elaborate gowns tailored. Not to mention the huge expense of those great and gaudy hats. Maybe at 69 you saw a certain allure in the conditions of house arrest. I'm in my late 40s and I'll tell you right now, it's crossed my mind a time or two. Or maybe you saw more in that telescope than you were prepared to tell us. Either way, the more I mull over your defiant last words, the more I want to say them out loud to everyone I meet. Nevertheless, it moves. A question of prefixes um, is this one. And uh, Denis Diderot, 1784, uh, unless you're from Oklahoma, then it's Dennis Diderot. <laughs> but uh, in 1784, his last words are said to have been, the first step towards philosophy is incredulity. I incline towards disbelief as opposed to unbelief. I have never felt a need for there not to be a God. I just worried even as a kid that the pious all around me were, well, uncredible. As opposed to my dad, a pastor who is among the more credible humans I have ever known, I'd go as far as to say, incredible. It's just that I have enjoyed disbelieving, or let's say the sin of questioning. A key weapon in the great battle against unbelieving, I believe. Possibly even means to someday re-believing. All right, so here we go. William Barrett Travis, 1836. His last words known words were, God and Texas, victory or death. <laughs> Texas is really four states, which is an oversimplification. To West Texans, an East Texan ain't no gooder than all the other trouble that come over from Louisiana, and besides, they got them a tree problem over there. <laughs> to East Texans, a man from El Paso might as well be from Tijuana. While those up in the north, as far as the other three states are concerned, are just Okies. <laughs> and since my in-laws hail from the south, I'll leave that one alone for now. But as a whole, this state's collective psychological tip remains that everybody still talks like William Barrett Travis three days before the Alamo, seeming to forget that everybody died. <laughs> <laughs> Matahari, uh, the great madam of the very famous Bordello in Paris, uh, uh, died at the hands of her arrested state in uh, 1917, when she was finally brought up on charges. Her last words were, it is unbelievable. <laughs> and, but it was her last gesture that got me. It is unbelievable, I suppose. Gravity that we adhere to a carbon ball, the immediacy of bias in the news, and a blueberry's power to stain cement, birth, the popularity of reality television, the Kardashians, unbelievable, styrofoam, aerodynamics, Congress, pork, that coffee one day met up with cream, my daughter singing, fermentation, and that Matahari blew a kiss to her firing squad. <laughs> Isadora Duncan in 1927 is said to have said, farewell my friends, I go to glory. The title of the poem is A Friend or Someone. At times I wonder how many of the glamorously notorious did not say as they were dying what they are said to have said, but were saved, let's say, by a friend or someone who had a better idea for what should have been said. For example, I go to glory versus 
I go now to have sex in a hotel room with a sexy French-Italian mechanic, which it turns out is much closer to what Miss Duncan actually said. So, I hope a good friend or someone with a better idea and tongue will do the same for me. <laughs> Theodore Dreiser, 1945, his last words were, Shakespeare, here I come. <laughs> The poem is My Double Shot Heaven. My heaven, as if I'd get to choose, would be an old coffee house with worn out wooden floors, full of regulars puffing on pipes because it doesn't matter anymore. Mark Twain, a regular there, might be arguing with Gandhi and would shout poppycock, of course, at some point in the conversation. F. Scott Fitzgerald would sit in the dark rubbing his temples at a back corner table with friends, still worried that Zelda will come in and find him having a good time. <laughs> and Gertrude Stein would set foot, of course, hoping to be seen, though still quite displeased with everyone's behavior, particularly Hemingway and Bukowski. But old Buck wouldn't give a damn. He had him cared, never had him cared for the expats. He'd be over by the window in boxers and black boots pouring whiskey into his coffee, bitching about Paris and New York with Louis Celine. And who knows, Shakespeare himself might even walk in at some point, and everyone would shout out, hey, you know, with raised hand, but then roll their eyes at each other while he orders his skinny vanilla latte with a flourish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and just two more. Um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, in 1948, his last words were, Oh God, right after being shot in the chest at point blank range. To hold your head high and stare straight into the verdict of their unsteady gun barrels. To say, I will not fight you, but I will not move from here. To watch a mist of confusion creep along the blue steel shafts until it reaches their gutless fingers. And to see the cracked eggshells of their bloodshot eyes go wide and begin to twitch in the sockets of their hot, anemic faces. As the realization wraps around their throats that they will lose on both sides of this trick. And then uh, I'll end with this one. Um, Charles Bukowski's gravestone reads, Don't Try. I just love it. And uh, by the way, it is, it is a totally unremarkable gravestone in a massive cemetery in Palos Verdes down at the bottom of South Bay in California. It took me hours to find it. I finally had to give up actually and ask the guys um, to to help me find it. But, and when I walked up, by the way, I had a liter of tequila with me. Uh, I owed Bukowski a drink. And, um, <laughs> and when I walked up, I had this liter of tequila poking out of my backpack. I walked up and the guy that worked at the cemetery was like, Bukowski? <laughs> Don't try. To spend even a minute pondering what he might have meant would be to ignore his advice. <laughs> Tricky bastard, that Bukowski. So forget about him, he's dead. Which would also be his advice, by the way, if ghosts were prone to giving it. And his epitaph does remind me of something Dad told me long ago. Right after a more than upstanding deacon stormed out of his study at the church in a thick cloud of righteous indignation. Man, that guy is going to overshoot heaven as sure as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate that. She's a bartender at the Continental Club, and she's been a good friend for a long time. And uh, she gave, we, uh, we give each other books for our birthdays, and she's given me almost exclusively Bukowski until this one. And it was this book, it was sort of basically a reference book on people's last words, and I started reading it. And even though I didn't use all of those and researched others, what I discovered about the book is that most really famous people said three or four different things as their <laughs> last words. So in the end, you just kind of had to choose which one you liked the best.
Um, <laughs> it's sort of like Mary, mother of Jesus, in Jerusalem is buried in four different places. Mm -hmm. you know, whichever one you think is the prettiest, you know, go to that. Because I'm sure she's there in, in all of them. And, uh, but I just began realizing, I, I was shocked by how, like, from Socrates up to John Denver, how similar people are in their last minutes. How they all kind of say similar things, either funny or serious, but it's like, no more BS. And it blew me away. And I just, I, I really started writing these poems before the idea for book ever even came to mind. Can we hear the John Denver poem? <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 Unless it's like this is like an epic. Um, no, no, no. It's very no. They're all. I don't write really low in poems usually. Um, I mean, when else are we going to hear a poem? I tell people I don't even want to hear myself that much. You know, so, uh, I tend to write shorter poems. I John. Denver, the reason that John Denver is the last one in the book is that basically he's the reason I'm here, and I know that sounds kind of silly. Uh, when I was eight years old, I had an older brother handed me an LP, you know, the, the really big CDs. Um, <laughs> handed me an LP of John Denver, and I put it on the turntable. And I was eight years old, and it kind of remapped my brain. And I got a guitar, and I started writing really, really, really bad songs. And by the time I was 13, I was playing really, really bad bands. And by the time I was 17, I was making a living as a, as a professional musician. And so John Denver is the whole reason that I have this life of making no money at all, <laughs> uh, but having a total blast. And um, so his last words, if you don't know John Denver, uh, was was a pilot, and he he was he loved experimental aircraft and small planes, and he had an experimental aircraft that, uh, aircraft that went down into Monterey Bay, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, he died instantly. His last words were to the radio tower, and uh, his last words were, do you have it now? Do you have it now? No, Joan, but I've been looking, <laughs> listening, searching for so long since you died before I was ready. You know my life is your fault. This life of songwriting, poverty, and the poems that mostly I give a damn about. But I'm getting closer, closer to something with the lighthouse flash of every passing year. I can't explain it, but I think it has to do with what you were asking. Though all the panic and static, through all the panic and static on your plane's radio, right before it went down in Monterey Bay. And that's vague, I know, but I want to thank you for everything. And for leaving me with the question instead of the answer. And, and by the way, right immediately after that, the book actually ends with a quote um, with James McMurtry, who's a songwriter here in Austin, who, by the way, is Kelly Sullivan's, the, the girl who gave me the book, uh, is, is James McMurtry's significant other of about 12 years. And, and, uh, and uh, so, they're a strange twosome to be caught, caught in between. Whew, they're a wild, they're a wild couple of folks. But I love this two-line quote from James uh, McMurtry. The book closes with he says, "It is not our job to be loved; it's our job to be remembered." So, anyway. Any other questions for me? Questions for Elizabeth or Charlotte? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're professional. <laughs> well, this is just my <laughs> No questions, please. <laughs> no. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, a great listening to you. I was just thinking what a good idea a poet laureate is. And uh, maybe we have like poet laureates for every little community out there, uh, cities and everything. Have you, in your travels, met many poet laureates and are they everywhere? Is there a place on earth? I, you know, no, not every place on earth. But in Texas, uh, I, I have four friends uh, who are Texas poet laureates and uh, great folks and good friends. I just did readings with them out in New Mexico. New Mexico, a state, strangely enough, that does not have a state poet laureate. Uh, but Santa Fe and Albuquerque do. And so it's an unusual thing. Um, Oklahoma, uh, the only state that has had a poet laureate position longer than Oklahoma is California. And Oklahoma's began in 1950. And so it's a long, long tradition. 
and in Scott Mamaday, and I mean, it's a, Oklahoma has a wonderful tradition, a wonderful tradition. Well, I meant, I meant it quite seriously. I, I, I like the idea of not just tourism, economics, cultural economics, uh, the idea that you don't have a lot of money seems like a travesty, but the idea that uh, places could become voiced through more artists. Yeah. Like, no, I will tell you flat out that it was the, it was one of the biggest helps to what I do of anything that's ever happened for me. Yeah, it helped me more than anything else. That, and Los Angeles is the only place I know of where they. Uh, I got Oklahoma. By the way, I got Oklahoma to begin a stipend for the Oklahoma Poet Laureate. It's only five. You serve two years, and it's only five thousand dollars. But still, it's a it's a beginning. And it needs to be the case in more states, and it needs to, you know, I said, but these, are, these folks are doing something that's very tough. Uh, poetry is not the most popular of the literary sports, uh, you know, and uh, when it comes to sales and, or, or whatever. And they need to be supported, and you're exactly right. And it's a, but it's a good thing, and it was extraordinarily helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a follow up uh, What's the most rewarding? Teaching experience. I, I'm now teaching less at the university level and doing more workshops and things. Workshops. And I just got back from working with uh, high schoolers, uh, slam poets at the Taos Poetry Festival. I just returned. My daughter, who's 19 and a fabulous classical guitarist, uh, came and uh, performed so well around the campfire on Thursday night, they actually asked her to perform in the main event on Friday night. And she stole the poetry festival. <laughs> uh, all the poets were really pissed. And, and, uh, but I, I tell you what, working with those high schoolers there in Taos, um, I, I, I'll tell you right now, a couple of them blew my head off. I came home intimidated. Like, crap, I gotta get to work. <laughs> and, uh, I don't have this book thing quite figured out yet. But, uh, because they killed me. And so, unbelievable. I mean, just did it. It was high school. They just took me. So that was a very fulfilling workshop experience. We have time for a couple more questions for any of our readers. Maybe what's the next time you're going to teach at ACC? I hope this fall. <laughs> if the class what, makes what class? What class would that be? That would be intro to songwriting. Um, songwriting is is uh, what I've done most most of my life, and I and uh, I still work as a singer songwriter and travel and do concerts. My, basically, my favorite thing that I do now is house concerts, um, and where I combine music and poetry. It's the biggest blast. Uh, I, it's unbelievable, and I've never had a bad experience with it. And, uh, it's truly amazing. But I hope to be teaching intro to songwriting at Austin Community College. Thank you, Dean. Um, <laughs> this uh, this fall. So if anybody's interested, spread the word on that. And what it is is that when we a lot of times when you workshop or teach, you know, songwriting and stuff like that. It, Sometimes it tends to be sort of music heavy, like we're working on the blah. And, and what I what I want this class to really dig into is uh, the music business is in desperate need of better lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of pointed. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, I uh, you know uh, I, that's and that's what this class is really going to focus on is digging into the words that go with the music. Yeah, so. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, is this not awesome? <laughs> <laughs> this little nook for reading, I swear, I, it's so cool. Yeah, I just did a reading in Santa Fe where my backdrop was stacks of books, floor to ceiling behind my head. That was one of my other favorite. Um, it could have fallen at any moment. It was really exciting. How about your reading? Um, so. Yeah, this is great. This is beautiful. And did you have to do with this as well? Okay, nice, nice work. <laughs> Thank you, Malvern Books. I appreciate it so much.